I suppose all of us have childhood memories that we treasure. Going to the beach, spending summers with friends, playing ball in the neighborhood, something like that. Holiday celebrations, it might have been. The things we treasure about childhood are as unique as we are. And I'm no different from you. I have some treasured childhood memories. And some of them are unique. Case in point, for years, the Stanleys have had a tradition on Christmas Eve of having shrimp cocktail, potato soup, and sloppy joes. This tradition developed when my maternal grandparents were still alive. And I have to tell you, it's not just that exquisitely fine pairing that makes that night special. It's the fact that we've done it for so long and the people that are associated with it. What's your special tradition or your special memory? I trust you have one or more of those. If time permitted, we could share and we could really be encouraged by hearing one another's special memories. Uh, We don't have time for that, but I would like to, if I can, share another memory of mine. I promise not all of them have to do with food, but this one also does. Some of you remember Ponderosa and Bonanza restaurants. They were a, a, a sort of steakhouse. With probably not the greatest steaks in the world, but along with the purchase of a steak came access to a huge buffet. And my parents and our family, we love to go to these places on Friday nights or Saturday nights. I can remember the layout of the restaurant on Olentangy River Road we most often went to. I can remember one of the waiters that we had. I can remember some of the items on the buffet bar that I particularly liked. Uh, Garbanzo beans and that cubed ham, in my case, if you care. Now, if you're interested, it turns out that Ponderos and Bonanza merged some time ago. Uh, Most of them are gone, though, unfortunately. Uh, There is one left in the Columbus area on South High Street, if you're I've whetted your appetite. Buffet restaurants are a great thing if you were a kid or a teenager. Seemingly endless variety, definitely endless quantity. But as a friend and fellow elder recently pointed out to me, this smorgasbord type of restaurant, while popular in the 90s, is less common today. He suggested that this is due to a shift in the way people think about food and maybe even about life in general. There's an undercurrent in society, even a movement that says that more is not necessarily better. Even though we realize this on the one hand, the problem of having too many options for our own good is very real, isn't it? It's become, in some ways, an epidemic. Buffets may not be as popular as they once were, but the menu of life options has exploded. And many of us living our lives are feeling overcommitted, spread so thin that we've now got kind of a bad taste in our mouths. You might think in an environment like this that participation in groups and partnerships would be an all-time high because people are so overcommitted. But it turns out that's probably not true. Participation in civic activities and significant social interactions has actually been declining. We can show this statistically. There was a book actually written back in 2000 by a man named Robert D. Putnam called Bowling Alone. And the title of Putnam's book comes from an example he gives to demonstrate his point. In the 20 years prior to the year 2000, participation in bowling had increased, but yet participation in bowling leagues had decreased. 
And Putnam uses this example to show that though we are more committed to activities than we have ever been, our participation with other people in those activities is actually declining. If you've ever tried to organize people for any group function, you know it's really difficult. We all so often take this sort of smorgasbord approach to life, and much like the smorgasbord, we have lots of quantity, but not necessarily the highest quality. If you're looking for groups to be a part of, you have plenty of opportunities, but your participation in these partnerships and groups is likely to be less and less significant. Not only because there are more group options, but because we tend to be nowadays engaged more in individual pursuits. If you read ahead in your Discover 40 book, you know by now that the church value we're covering this week is we partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission. We partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission. If you considered last week's value to be perhaps one of the more unique or unexpected, this value is somewhat expected, but I would suggest it's the value that we might be most likely to underestimate in its difficulty to apply practically. Partnering with others to accomplish Christ's mission is not going to be easy. But today we're going to take a look at a few short passages of scripture that while they won't make this pursuit easy, will help us know a way forward in this. The way forward requires us, it turns out, to start even simpler than we might expect. We're going to ask three simple questions today to try to wrap our minds around what it would look like to partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission. And the first of those questions is the most basic of all of them. We can't partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission if we don't know what Christ's mission is. So that's the first question we're going to look at today. What exactly is Christ's mission? Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 28, verse 16. We find this passage at the very end of Matthew's account of Jesus' life. Jesus has already been crucified. He died, was buried, and has been raised from the dead. And these are the last recorded words that Matthew puts in his gospel. So they're important. They're so important, in fact, that Christians for centuries have referred to what we're going to read here as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Please stand with me, if you would, as we read this great commission, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. You may be seated. Within the Great Commission itself, which is technically just verses 19 and 20 there, there are four significant verbs in just two verses. You probably remember from English class that verbs are words of action or perhaps state of being. We have four verbs in just two verses. Was Jesus giving us four different commands or one command four times? How is it that these actions relate to one another. Well, it's helpful to understand what is the main action, the main verb that is in the Great Commission. So we're going to have a little vote. 
How many vote for go as the main verb in the commission? Right, show of hands. Okay. How many vote for make? One hand. Okay. Uh, I saw some, saw some more there. Okay. A few others weighing in at the end. All right. How many vote for baptizing? All right. And how many for teaching? All right. The minority is right. It's not as clear in English, but it's very clear in Greek that the main verb of the Great Commission is the word make, or actually more specifically, make disciples, which is one word in the Greek language. The disciple was simply a learner, or maybe in modern day terms, if we think at how the trades work or how medicine works as you're training someone, it's somebody who's an apprentice. Let's stop right now and consider that for a second. This is really important, Eastside. What is the purpose of the church, according to the Great Commission? It is to make disciples. It's not to conduct Sunday services. It's not to have children's and youth programming. It's not to serve the poor. The mission of the church, the mission of Eastside, is to make disciples. But Pastor Bo, isn't it important to gather for worship? Isn't it important to reach young people and kids? Isn't it important to serve the poor? Yes, it absolutely is. But those things are all items that flow from the priority, which is to make disciples. But we don't stop there. Remember, there were some other ideas in this Great Commission, going, baptizing, teaching. So how does all of that relate together? Well, To get into the grammatical weeds here just a little further, there's technically only one verb in the Great Commission, make disciples. The other three action words are technically participles in Greek. Now, I don't expect you to remember how participles work I wouldn't remember how participles work, but I think I can explain the idea here by showing you something that you might have even seen yet this morning if you looked at your computer. In the Great Commission, we see that make disciples is the main idea, the main folder. If we could show that slide, the Great Commission slide, we'll forward to make disciples. Okay? That's the main folder. We have three subfolders under Make Disciples. The first one is going. One aspect of disciple making is going. Because of how this word's translated, scholars say that the idea here could be translated as you go. In other words, disciple making is actually something you do as you conduct your life. Now, it may require in some cases that you go somewhere geographically. You might have to go overseas to relocate as missionaries do. Most of us won't move overseas, but all followers of Jesus are included in this call, whatever our going may happen to look like. We make disciples as we go, but what else does making disciples involve? It involves baptizing. Now, what did Jesus mean when he talked about baptizing? Well, of course, he meant baptizing. (laughs) We know what baptizing is, but think about it. When is a person baptized according to the New Testament pattern? After they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, right? After they've trusted in Christ. So when we see baptism in the Great Commission, we should understand that Jesus is referring to the act of baptism, and it stands for the inclusion of new people into the faith. That's the idea. New people coming in. The next subfolder is teaching. And what does teaching then symbolize? Well, if you look closely at the commission, you'll see that it says not just teaching, but teaching them to observe which means, just as Pastor John shared with a couple weeks ago, the idea is not simply to convey the information, it's to help 
people obey what Jesus has said. So think about the genius of this. Sometimes, by the way, if you're used to evangelical circles, you may have heard the term discipleship, and for you that means the growing up of a believer in his or her faith, as opposed to evangelism, which is as we share the gospel. But I think that terminology is unfortunate because as the Great Commission stands, disciple-making or making disciples is the big overarching banner. And within that, we go, we bring new people into the faith as symbolized by baptizing, and then we teach them to observe all that Jesus Christ has commanded. So you have the entrance into the faith, the growing up of the faith, and the going that's necessary to bring them to the faith, all included in the calling to make disciples. That's the mission of Christ. If we want to partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission, we have to understand what Christ's mission is. And it's relatively simple to make disciples. We go to people. We don't wait for them to come to us. As we go, we share Jesus with them, and they become believers, and we baptize them. Once they're baptized, we don't just leave them. We stick with them and teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded. Because of our culture, after understanding this mission, it might be our tendency to want to go it alone. I feel that. You feel that. We Americans are very progress-oriented people, and we're also very individualistic. So it might take some convincing for us to partner with others in this mission. Let's ask this question honestly. If we could do things ourselves, why would we want to partner with others in accomplishing the mission of Christ. Well, because we can't do it ourselves. But in thinking about how we should partner, I thought of the West African proverb that transformational leadership likes to quote. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. There's tremendous practical value in partnering with others if you want to do anything significant in life. Not only do you have extra manpower in such cases, but you also find out, curiously, that the whole is usually greater than the sum of the parts. Ten people working together might be 15 times better than one person alone because of the diversity of perspectives and skills and so forth. And all of this is true, of course, but when we speak of partnering for Christ's mission, the justification comes from Christ's work, not from the simple pursuit of efficiency. Does that make sense? We're not just about being efficient in this. We partner with others because there's an underlying unity that Jesus has brought about that's miraculous in nature. So first, let's consider the basis of internal partnership or partnership within our own church. And then talk about external partnership. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. The most important metaphor we see in the New Testament for the church is the body, the body of Christ. And when we consider how the body functions, it's obvious that the parts do not function in isolation. In fact, they can't function in isolation. They need one another. They contribute to one another. And note here that Paul calls attention to different functions of the body, seeing and hearing and smelling. And for a church like Eastside, one that's been in existence for decades and as such faces the temptation to be internally focused, this idea of the functions of the body can help 
us. The partnership of the members of the body is to enable the body, think about this, not just to exist, but the partnership of the members of the body enables the body to interact with forces outside the body. We partner for a mission, not just for our own pleasure or for our own goodness. But as you might have suspected, this value isn't just about how we partner with one another. It's also about partnering with believers who aren't part of our local church at Eastside. If you go back and look at the passage we read in Corinthians, you'll see that Paul's words there really dealt with unity as a local body of believers. So we have to ask the question, is there a unity that's broader, that exists within the church of Christ beyond the local church, that's the basis for broader partnership? There is indeed. Listen, if you would, as I read from the letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This passage adds to our understanding from 1 Corinthians 12. We see here that the bond that exists between believers in Jesus Christ goes beyond this four walls. It goes to anyone who is trusted in Jesus Christ, in whom the Holy Spirit lives by virtue of Jesus' gift that comes at the time of salvation. So we have divine basis for partnering with other churches, other Christian organizations, other believers, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, because there is a supernatural unity that exists between us through Jesus Christ. We partner with those internal, we partner with those external. This seems obvious. So I ask, what's holding us back? Well, there are some church-wide constraints, and there are some individual constraints. One church-wide constraint we face is lack of clarity on what a partnership should look like. It's one thing to say we partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission. It's another to work that out skillfully when churches and groups have different doctrines, even different traditions that make partnerships in some cases more or less desirable. And you may say, I'm not even totally sure what we as a church believe in terms of our doctrine. Well, if you don't, I would encourage you to look on our website. We have some information on our beliefs, perhaps even more directly. You can go to the Hub after the service, and we've ordered a number of copies of a document called The Caris Commitment to Common Identity. We are part, as Eastside, of a global fellowship of churches called the Caris Alliance. The word Caris means grace in Greek. And in 2015... The entire alliance of churches worldwide came together and wrote this document to express not only what we believe, but to give clarity on various tiers that help us to understand the degree of unity we have with one group or another. So this helps us in navigating partnerships with other churches. Again, you'll find several copies of that at the Hub. It's also online at charisfellowship.org. So I'd, enc- I'd encourage you to take a look at that. It will be very helpful for us going forward as we look at partnerships. The main churchwide constraint to our partnership with others, however, I would suggest, is not doctrinal. It's due to a simple lack of awareness. 
Just as our lives can become very self-contained on the individual level, our church will tend to do the same unless we consciously focus on partnering with others. Let me give you an example. Last Sunday evening, I attended with Tess Snyder a uh, prayer meeting. In fact, uh, Lipinski's were there. It was actually, there were a number of us here from, uh, from Eastside at this prayer service that was uh, an evangelical prayer service from of groups on the southeast side of Columbus. Now, I know very well that we have a significant ministry to the Nepalese community in our food pantry. What I did not know, but I found out through this event, is that there is a Nepalese evangelical church meeting at Reynoldsburg United Methodist Church. I met the pastor of this church. You think that would be useful information to know? Yeah. But in this case, it was lack of awareness. I simply did not know that information, and therefore to even pursue a partnership would have been very difficult. My experience of that prayer event brings up the main individual constraint. It's hard to partner with others because partnering with others has scheduling implications. And it was a Sunday night. And to be completely honest with you, I didn't want to go. I mean, I'm tired after Sunday morning. I'm like, my brain is like, you know, just mush or something like that on Sunday evenings. But thankfully, by God's grace, I went, I overcame that individual constraint, and I found out after the fact, I was like, wow, that was pretty great. The thing that saved me in the end was that I had to show up. I was actually one of the people praying at the event, so it would have been really awkward otherwise. But why did I commit to praying that, at that event? I committed to praying at that event because I believed it was important. And when we believe that partnerships with others to accomplish Christ's mission are important, what we're going to see is that the value of partnering with others becomes clearer to us as we partner with others. It's the sort of thing you go into saying, I hope this isn't lame. And you, then you say, wow, that was really useful. When we do it, we'll say, I guess that was valuable. Several weeks ago, we talked about victory gardens the World War II phenomenon in which everyday Americans grew vegetables in their backyards and on public lands to help out the war effort. When you're in peacetime, working with others, it's a nice luxury. When you're in a war, partnering with others is not a luxury. It's a necessity. East side, we are in a war. We are in a war. It's a very real war. It's not a war against flesh and blood. It's a war, as Paul said, against the principalities and powers, supernatural forces that seek to destroy us, that seek to destroy our families, our church families, and the mission of Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the outcome has already been secured. But only a fool would seek to enter into a war by himself or herself. No sane person fights a war alone. And if we're in this war, it would be absolutely crazy to say to others, both within and outside the church, I don't need you. I'll take care of it. I'm good. We're fine. See ya. As the worship team comes to the stage... Let's remember that truth. No sane person fights a war alone. Do you accept that we're in a war? Do you accept that? You'll probably find it out if you don't know it already. That's when concepts like mission become meaningful. We partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission, not because it makes us feel better, though it does, Not because it's convenient, though it leads to greater effectiveness. We partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission because he has placed us in a war that we want to win. What will be your response today? 
How will you partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission or help us as a church to partner with others to accomplish Christ's mission? Maybe you say, well, I'd like to pick up one of those documents, the Karis Commitment to Common Identity, do a little digging on the web to find out about other Karis Fellowship churches in our area. There are several, actually. Maybe you'll start by praying for other churches around us or Christian organizations that you know of. Perhaps it's something more specific to our local church. Maybe it's committing to attend Sunday services regularly. If you picture the church as an organization that gives you something, if you're not in the mood for that something, which we all are at times, sometimes we're just not in the mood, well then it becomes much less compelling to be here. But if you see yourself as part of a mission, as a soldier in a war, then you start to see more clearly that we need you and that you need us. The ultimate motivation for partnership, however, is a recognition that God made it possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, in whom Jew and non-Jew, male and female, slave and free, high and low, have been united for this mission, and that the very design of God's salvation was to redeem for himself one people. So perhaps you feel challenged by the unity we have in Christ and are thinking, I haven't really lived in this unity. I've been going at this as a solo act, but I'm interested in partnering with others to accomplish Christ's mission. So write down one of those simple responses from just a moment ago on your worship program. Maybe take that with you. Maybe put that in one of the black boxes at the back of the auditorium so we on staff can support you in prayer in this. And if you feel challenged and think, I'm not very good at this. Be reminded as we sing that we come to a father's arms who are open wide. 